So welcome today to Proverbs Through the Eyes of the Living Letters. Today, we're going to be continuing on with Proverbs chapter 14, and we're going to be looking at the verses 26 through 30. I've been really looking forward to this particular section of the uh, of the Proverbs here because they're, I've been talking a lot over the last, I don't know, several months, especially about the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I know I've had some conversations with people with regards to this, and and uh, there is a beautiful expression of what I believe is two different perspectives that we can have on the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so one of those is the place of holiness or the the spirit of awe or looking and when we when we see the Lord, it's the place of awe. But I don't know that that word, at least to me, not, I'm just I'm looking at it from my perspective here when I say this, at least to me doesn't quite fit the depth of what I see inside of my spirit, man, with regards to the spirit of the fear of the Lord. For me, there's this place of just as, just as Moshe, just as, or Moses, just as, as uh, Isaiah and several uh, prophets and several men of God that when the Lord appeared before them, what did they do? They fell flat on their face and they were quaking. They were shaking in their in their shoes. And it wasn't necessarily just a spirit of awe or an expression of awe as to re- as to why they were doing that. The only way that I can really express it in English words or even in Hebrew right now is this place of standing before the holiness of God. And I don't know about you, but for me, as I as I step into that place of the holiness of God, as I begin to see the holiness, I begin to shake in my shoes. It's it's almost as if the feeling that I have on the inside of me is the fear that I used to have about other things, about those things that are necessarily wrong. So it began to make me wonder. I, I told you guys the story about this one time where where I was in a situation, or was I was doing something that was very innocuous. There was nothing about what I was doing, but a spirit of the fear of the Lord hit me. And I was like, what in the world was this? Why all of a sudden do I have this, this almost place where I'm shaking in my shoes? And I heard the Lord tell me, he said, I'm taking you into a deeper aspect of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so the truth is, is it can be both. And That place of where he took me into the spirit of the fear of the Lord, when I began to literally shake in my shoes with regards to the revelation of the holiness of God and who I am before a holy God, looking at it, I guess, more from the perspective of my flesh, because, you know, just like um, Isaiah said, he said, "I'm I'm a man of unclean lips. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a people of unclean lips. Well, you've got a, you've got a, a, that's, that's just one expression of it. For me, it was this gripping place of just the holiness of God and operating from that place of being, of being able to stand before that place of the whole, or if you will, I can't really stand Truth be told, if I was to express, it's never a standing. It's always a flat on my face before before Father. And so as we go through these next verses, we're going to begin to see a greater depth about the spirit of the field. Lord, I'm going to talk a lot about this. So in verse 26, it begins to say this. Now in the Michelet, it says something a little different than the Passion Translation does as always. And I love both expressions of what is being said here. In verse 26 in the Mishlei, it says, in fear of Hashem is a powerful stronghold and his children, and for his children, it will be a refuge. Dr. Simmons in the Passion Translation says it this way, confidence and strength flood the hearts 
of lovers of God who are in who live in awe of him and their devotion provides their children with a place of shelter and security now it's funny cuz when i when i look at to the both of these i i'm beginning to see both aspects of what i was describing to you guys earlier in the michele it, it gives that expression of that place of of literally shaking in your shoes about about a, 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 a gripping fear but it's not a bad fear can you be afraid like you were before can fear have an expression where it makes you shake in your shoes just like you did before when you were afraid about other things, but for a whole nother reason? Is there another side to fear that we've rejected because we associated that feeling along with that, if you will, that negative aspect of fear? You following me? When what we were sensing was really the place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And it was causing us to do what? It was causing us to stop and say, okay, stop. Think about what's going on. Look at your surroundings. Be, be cognizant of what's going on around you and be cognizant of what's inside of your heart and then move forward carefully. You see, there's nothing wrong with that. That's exactly what the, the Lord many times will tell, will, will have us to do. I've explained to you guys before, and, and I've, I've mentioned this before in several of our classes, this place of where the Lord will begin to, I'll begin to sense something, especially when it's when it's just uh, uh, suddenly, and it's not a, a attributed to a situation or anything like that. There's times that I begin to feel that place of that fear, and and uh, I used to would dismiss it because I always saw that as a negative, a negative aspect. But when Father took me into that place that I'd the story I just told you where he told me, I'm taking you into another level. He had me look at it again. He had me look at the spirit of this, of this fear in the place of it re referencing or of it showing me a deeper aspect of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so I began to listen to it. I began to say, okay, let me, let me hear father, what it is that you are saying here. Because I know when I sense this, when I feel this, you're calling me to this place of, of looking to you. I haven't talked about it in a while, but I, I really feel Holy Spirit's wanting me to mention it again. And sometimes when I have feelings or situations or it's like this with the, the spirit of fear, there are three questions that, that the Lord shared with me a long time ago that have helped me to understand better about how to proceed with something. The first question is this: If if I begin to feel a, a, an emotion, especially fear, that uh, that I wasn't expecting, my first question is, Lord, is there something that I did? Do I is there something that you're letting me know that I need to correct or or something like that? And many times, that's there's a quick answer for that. I'll I'll almost know the answer ahead of time, but most of the time, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't respond at all. So I ask a second question after a few moments and say, well, Lord, are you placing this on me to allow me to intercede for someone else who's walking through a difficult situation or walking and they're, they're sensing this? And there have been times that he has done just that. He'll he'll bring up a name and I'll begin to pray for them with regards to the, to the, the, the emotion that I'm feeling at that particular moment. But if he doesn't say anything about that, or if he says no on the first two questions, then I know that the third question is not really a question, but an answer. And that third question is this, Father, are you calling me to spend time with you? Are you asking me to minister to you? And so I know if the first two are no, then that's what he's doing. He's calling me into that time of being quiet and private with him to spend that time and and explore what it is that 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 is going on on the inside of me so that i have the opportunity through his eyes to be able to see what what may be causing this or maybe it's just simply this place of a call and a cry to slow down a little bit how many i i don't know about you guys but for me that Many times I would I would go past those feelings and again dismiss them as being negative when many times that the Lord was the one who was calling me into a place of connection and deeper connection with him. 
if my eyes, if my, if I become what I behold, does that mean that I only become what I behold in the good times? Or can it also be in those times when, when I'm sensing or feeling or even going through a difficult time? Do I still become what I behold? Yes. Why? Because he's calling me into that place of being quiet with him. And so this is where Dr. Simmons, and I think he did a great job with this, confidence and strength flood the hearts of the lovers of God who live in this place of not only awe, but yeah, even that shaken in your shoes kind of fear. Neither one of them are wrong, right? Neither one of them are wrong. Both have a beautiful expression. And their, to, and their devotion provides their children with a place of shelter and security. I remember when I was going through this and reading this, there was a couple of words that just jumped out at me, and uh, particularly from the Mishlei. In the Mishlei, it says, In fear of Hashem is a powerful stronghold, and for his children it will be a refuge. This is just two different versions of the same verse. But that word of refuge began to jump out at me because I remembered the scriptures where it talks about the place of a rock of refuge, that place where we, that the Lord is a refuge to us. And in the Mishle, it goes into a deeper expression of this. And it, when I saw this, it really rattled my bones when he, when I began to, to see what this is saying. Because Many times when we see the word refuge, we think about a place where we go into like a, a, a cave or a, 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 a I, when I was looking up pictures as to how I would, how I would, um, you know, put the, uh, the, the invitation for today and the, the graphics for today's uh, class. Uh, one of the things I was looking for was that place of a refuge or a shelter. And there were several that came up that I thought were really good. And I chose the one that I used with two men sitting in a, inside of a cave, looking out from the cave. But what does that do? If there's a storm going on on the outside, a cave then becomes a shelter and a refuge from that place of the storm that's, that's raging on the outside of that. So now you can stay dry. You can light a fire. You can do all kinds of things inside of that, that cave, you know, or one of the pictures actually had a man sitting in a inside of a little cove inside of a rock that was just big enough for him. And the rock was just a little bit bigger than him. But if the wind was coming from the backside of that rock, then he would have been protected by the wind and the cold wind. And it had a picture of, of like snow or, you know, it seemed like it was very cold in that place. And he was protecting himself from a, a gale of wind. But it's more than that. You see, when I began to dig into the Hebrew aspect of this, it brought up a really interesting point. When, when the 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 Hebrew here for the the word for refuge is chiseyon, chiseyon, chet samek yod vav nun. Now I know some of you may not know those uh, know those letters yet, but that's okay. I'm I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about them. Chet is a letter of, if you will, fence or boundary. It's a letter of the expression of, really, to me, of covenant and promise as well. So if you think about a, a, like a cave or a, or a cleft in the rock or that sort of thing, you see a boundary, something that blocks something from coming at you. So now that now this picture makes a little bit more sense when we look at it with the living letter Chet. The next letter in Kiseyon, uh, Kiseyon is Samech. Samech is a letter that speaks about supernatural support. So it speaks of something that goes that's goes beyond just the place of us being able to, to take care of things uh, on our own, but to the place where Father gives us freely. From him. And so, and 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 it's 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 almost like the word uh supernatural support and grace could almost be synonymous in this case. Yod, a letter of the light of the father, vav a connection, and nun sofit. There's only one definition that the Lord has given me about nun sofit, till we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Now when I look at the word 
uh, chiseyon. I find that this that the the vav nun that that pref that suffix on the end of that actually speaks about that word being a refuge, but it's a little refuge. All right. So I don't remember what the Hebrew word for kitchen is right off the top of my head, but uh, if I use the word bidachon, uh, which is the Hebrew word for trust, uh, trust, betuach is the Hebrew word that speaks of trust. Bitachon is an active part of it, but it's a little. It's it's It makes it like, so it's kind of like the difference between kitchen and kitchenette. Make sense? So you, now you're starting to see the, the 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 difference, and so that kind of struck me a little bit because I was like, little refuge, little trust, and I realized that I could see it from two different perspectives. One of those being that place of where inside of me, even if all I have is just a little bit of trust, even if all I'm doing is finding a little piece of refuge. Father says that I'm going to take that little intention and expand it out to the place where you are fully protected. But not only you, this place will also be for your children as well. And I ask the question, why? Why is it that my children will have that? When they see us trusting in a time where trust is difficult, taking refuge in a place, you see that word refuge there? actually refers to this place of, help me, Holy Spirit, actually refers to this place of the Lord gives us a word and he says to do something, but there's not necess- there's, there's not a promise that's attached to it. In other words, he just says, do this. I want you to go in this direction. But he doesn't give you a promise as to what he's promising you by doing that. Now, we look at, at Abraham, and Abraham, when he was told to go, there was a promise attached to it. Genesis 22, um, verse 12 and 17. Now, actually, this uh, this refers to um, Isaac. And not necessarily the go part, but this is talking about Isaac in Genesis 22, verses 12 and verse 17. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For I know that thou fears, that you fear God, seeing that you have not withhold your only son, your only son from me. And in verse 17, it goes on to say that in blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven. This is the promise that was attached to Abraham's action of of going to sacrifice Isaac. And the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. Now, this was specifically a promise that went along with this. Have there been times where you have been in a situation where the Lord's asked you to do something, but he has not necessarily given a promise behind it? Or there's been something in your heart where you've felt like you needed to do something, and and it was from this an urge from the Spirit of the Lord, but there wasn't really a promise that was attached to it. He didn't sp- speak specifically a promise. Now, I know some of you may say, well, no, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, because these are the questions I went through too. <laughs> I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, hold on. I know that the word gives me in this place of of the of obedience of when I when I move in a direction that I hear the father saying this then there's always going to be a promise attached to that right that, that he he takes care of my every need and so on but it really rattled me a little bit because I began to think you know how many times has have I not been able to specifically go back to something or I just was dealing with something Sometimes, sometimes it was something that was coming against me or something that was, you know, and I, I would used to, to, to cry out and say, you know, get away from me, devil, with regards to that. And not realizing that many of those times it was the Lord walking me through something. He didn't cause it. He did not cause it. Make sure you understand me here. He did not cause it, but he used it in that place of teaching me how to become more mature. 
unless I have something that uh, that 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 causes me to push against something else, it's just like lifting weights. Unless there's some sort of restriction or or a, a, a weightiness to it, how will I ever be able to grow stronger? It speaks about that place of maturity. I know that's so different from what we have heard before. So different. But follow me along here. This place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. My point in this was this. When our kids see us walk through things and we are walking through a difficult time and they see our responses to that, that is what they learn, right? We know that. We've said that. I, I said that when I was, when I, when my daughter was growing up. You know, she, you know, that, that I need to be careful about what I do, how I do it and how I respond to it. I was younger back then. And there's, there's, there's a place where I was, I was like, Lord, I wish that I could have done things differently even back then than what I did. But yet in the same breath, see, there's a place where I could, I could step over into um, condemnation. You know, thinking, oh, I I was so stupid and so young and da 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 da. That goes along with that. But the Lord says, but I was teaching you, and even through those difficult times, when your daughter saw that you didn't necessarily respond very good in a situation, she watched as you walked through that situation and how you changed your perspective on the other side of that. So it was equally as uh, equally. Expression, expressive to her. It was equally as much as a place of teaching to her as anything. Because sometimes we go through things where we have difficulties and we, we struggle against those difficulties. But where does the Lord take us in this? He's taking us to this place of becoming what we behold. Sometimes that means tearing down those old things and old ways that we see something. Now I want to go. I want to go a little bit deeper in this whole uh, chiseyon and bitzachon, but I, I'll just leave it right there for right now. Just, just remember that 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 sometimes we we have even just a little bit say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this, but I do trust you. I really do. And yet, the my hope I can say that out of my mouth and really mean it out of the out of the depths of my heart, but the rest of my flesh is going like this. It's, it's like, how can you do it? I just don't see the connection of how I can make it through this difficult situation. And so he reminds me, even with this, just a little bit of trust. He said, I can create a place of a refuge for you. And those that are watching you, those that are seeing this are seeing a place of where they see that you can do it. And they realize that they can do it as well. I don't know about you guys today, but I'm, I'm sensing a a, a kavod, a, a, a holiness, a glory. Kavod is actually the Hebrew for glory. And glory has a place of weightiness to it. And I realize that I'm as I'm talking about the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That's exactly what we're talking about. This place of 
this place of, of heaviness or weightiness. And it's not bad. Verse 27 continues on with this. And in the Mishle, it says this. The fear of Hashem, or the fear of God, is the source of life. To turn one away from the snares of death. In the Passion Translation, Dr. Simmons says this, To worship God in wonder and awe opens a fountain of life within you, empowering you to escape from death's domain. This, this expression of the spirit of the fear of the Lord to me, I mentioned it earlier, but I want to go a little bit deeper into this. I mentioned it earlier when this place where it, it many times will make me stop. If I sense this, this heaviness, sense this weight, sense this, if you will, shaking in my shoes, it makes me stop. And it makes me say, oh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. What's going on here? And it makes me more aware of my surroundings more aware of the expression of my own heart. Remember that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so sometimes I have to, I have to check and say, okay, wait, why am I feeling the way I am I feeling? I, I, I have learned over the years to not throw away those feelings. I remember for years how, how I thought that to become more godly was to not have feelings. And become very stoic. And it about killed me. It really did. It about killed me. Because I was killing the very expression of my spirit man. And I know some of you may see this a little differently. I've just, uh, the Lord has, has taken me away from the way that I used to see this to a whole new way. Particularly one day when he spoke to me about, and the two shall become one flesh. And he told me there was more to the fact that it was, this was just a marriage statement. And I began to see that the spirit and the soul are not two separate things, but the same thing. The spirit is that essence of who we are. The soul is the expression of that essence that comes through us. So they're not two separate things. The very essence of who I am cannot be shared. What can be shared is that part of the, of the expression of that essence, how I express it. How I, how I choose to, to speak, how I choose to react, how I choose to, to do anything, that part is a part that can be given. But the, but, the, but the pure essence of who I am can't be shared. Just like with Father, his echad is one. And that, that part of us is one with him and is an expression of the facet of the diamond of Yahweh. Well, what we can do is we can express those things through ourselves and through the expression of who Father has made us to be. And those are the things that people will know us by. So spirit and soul are one thing. So that means if that's the case, the two shall become one flesh speaks of the place of the spirit, soul, and the body becoming one. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken he will quicken your mortal body. In other words, the flesh will begin to change. And we will be the light beings that we have cried out to being. You see, the truth is, is that we already do give off light. Whether we, whether we realize it or not, we already do give off a light. Science has proven that. The flesh itself gives off a light. So there you go. If you, if you never believe that, go look it up scientific, all right? I promise you. Our flesh gives off a light, but it's a light that can't be seen by the naked eye. But by the Spirit, it can be. But what of Yeshua? What of Yeshua about the, the Mount of Transfiguration? When not only his spirit, but his flesh began to glow. And this was before he died on the cross. His flesh changed to this place of the going. I, I, I'm not wrapped up in, in doing just that. I, I'm not trying to, 
to my focus to be that place of becoming uh, this this light being and that everybody can see that the light is coming from me. That's not my intention. My intention is to be closer to my father more than anything else. If that happens, it happens as a result of the cry of my heart to be one with my father. To, to allow every single part of me to change, to become more like him. And I will love the Lord my God with all of my heart, my soul, and my strength. That full place of giving over to him. And if anything else happens beyond that, it's because it's an outcrop or an, an, uh, a, an expression of that, that was that's already inside of me. From that place, we stand in that place of confidence. We stand in that place of trust. So you see, in this place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord, it becomes a source of life. Why? Because it, it makes us cognizant of not only those things that are going on around us, those things that we cannot control, it also makes us cognizant of that which is on the inside of us and how we respond to it. And it rattles us, but it brings about a place of life because we're, we're becoming what we behold. We are expressing this place of the glory of God, and we're recognizing that his glory is, is in us and the and the glory of the lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the lord you see to me glory and the fear of the lord go hand in hand you cannot have one without the other period you cannot have one without the other It's a place in in uh, the Sepharia, which is another one of the books of, and it's a com it's a compilation of other books that are in the that are in Hebrew thought, and there is one called uh, Avot or Avos, uh, which means fathers. And it's 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 quotes directly from rabbis, and there's one in particular that really grabbed me, and it totally wraps up both of these first two verses. As a matter of fact, all five of these verses will relate back to these first two verses that we're talking about here. But this one really grabbed me. Anyone whose fear of sin takes priority to his wisdom, his wisdom will endure. It. Anyone whose fear of sin takes priority to his wisdom, his wisdom will endure. Now, do not try to interpret that from the old Western way that we've seen it before. When I talk about this place of the spirit, fear of sin, I've explained it already many times before. In that place where there's a gripping place inside of us where it causes us to stop. Our heart is in the expression of, I don't want to sin. Do we, Can we? Can we? Well, in this place where we're standing in the spirit of the fear of the Lord— I don't believe we can unless we purposefully make a choice to turn away from that. In other words, can we live in a place with where without sin? Many people would argue with me there. Do not say that we are without sin, right? And that's and that's that that is exactly right. But in him that's looking at it from a separated perspective when it says do not say that we are without sin. I believe that's looking at it from a a separated perspective. And I want to be careful here because I don't want to change the way that you, you see things. All I'm saying is open up your heart to look from another perspective and see that there is an expression in you that you can resolve inside of yourself, that Holy Spirit will help you resolve inside of yourself with regards to that, to what I'm saying. And you'll see both aspects of this. And so I'm not trying to change your doctrine or theology or anything else like that. But in the same breath, 
I do know that there is a place where, as we are, we are one with Father. And in that place to sin, could we? Yes. But I would really have to rip away everything that Father has done to cause me to go out and do that. To kill everything that 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 has happened. I, I don't know about you, but that scares the ever-living blah, blah out of me. Just by even thinking about that. And I want to be, I want to do want to be very careful. And so, Holy Spirit, I thank you. I feel like I'm I'm stumbling over my words a little bit here, but but that's okay. Because I know it's it's usually the times that I'm stumbling the most where I'm expressing just purely out of the place of my heart and and I'm not worried about how it's being said. And I really don't. I I know that you are the great teacher. And 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 what I'm speaking are the things that I see you speaking. But from the perspective that I know it as. So this place of the fear of sin is just like I'm expressing. If I'm standing in the glory of God, excuse me, if I'm laying flat on my face in the glory of God, there's an expression of his holiness that I am feeling. And that's the way, that's part of the, the heaviness and the weightiness that I'm feeling. When I see him in his glory, when I see it, at least in the fullness of the glory that I can see right now, do I see the fullness of his glory? No, I, I want to. Even, even Moshe said, let me see your glory. And he put his hand over his eyes and law him, let him see the, the backside, the, the departing, if you will, the, that place of the, the backside of his glory. But it was a life-changing time for Moshe, for Moses. It changed him from the, the, the very core because then he recognized that place of the holiness. You see where I'm... Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, I thank you that not only here in the class today, but also for those that are going to be listening on, on YouTube, this presence of God that I'm sensing right now, the spirit of the fear of the Lord that I'm sensing. You're taking us into a, a place where these attributes, this, this, this spirit of the fear of the Lord and your glory and the expression of your glory is so heavy and so weighty that it will be a wellspring of life. It will be a tool. It will be a wellspring of life. We can look at situations and look past what's going on on the outside and see the place of the expression of your glory, even in difficult things. We can stand in that place of confidence and trust, knowing that we're that we're that we're we're flat we're flat out on our faces before a holy God. And we're expressing that light. We may not even see the light. We may wrapped up, be wrapped up on our tallit and with our faces completely to the ground. We won't see that our bodies are actually shining and the light of your presence and your glory is, is covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. And Father, that, that where light is, darkness cannot be. Period. We've got so mixed up on that. Where light is, darkness cannot be, because light is there. I don't care if we see shadows or anything else that we may try and think in the in the linear sense or in the in the logical sense. It does. Where light is, darkness cannot be. Period.
Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the spirit of the fear of the Lord is, there is wisdom. So as anyone whose fear of sin takes priority over his wisdom, in other words, that place of saying, Father, I recognize that I'm a facet of you, and I'm standing in the place of your glory and your holiness. His wisdom will always endure. Because it's not about my wisdom. It's about the wisdom of my Father and the expression of who I am. Because I only have a facet of his wisdom. You have a facet of his wisdom. Jen Jameson, who's in the class, and I hope you don't mind me saying your name, Jen, but I'm so proud of you. She 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 sent out a, a, a picture the other day that she, she got from uh, Chabad.org. And um, it was beautiful. I want to read it to you. It's the reason I'm... Because this is, an, uh, when I've talked about the diamond of Yahweh and what I'm talking about here, this will make more sense. A team, a society, a world is healthy when each member says, if I don't add in my two bits, the whole system would fail. Stop right there. I recognize that I have something inside of me that contributes to the whole and if I can't contribute that part of who I am to the whole, then the whole system would fail. If one facet on the diamond of Yahweh was not there, would the diamond be as beautiful? I would argue and say no, because that facet is missing. That expression is missing. Can it be missing? Well, that's a whole other question and I want to get into right now. No one is here just because everyone else is here. No system can function from the top down alone because each of us and everything that was created has a spark of father, a spark of the divine, so that each of us is all of us. Now, I know some of you may be like, well, how does that fit within scripture? Yeshua himself said it when he was praying in the garden. Father, that they may be one, just as you and I are one. John 17, us in them and them in us, period. Paul talked about it when he talked about how every joint supplies. The fear of the Lord is the source of life. See where I'm, You see how this is all connecting together? So let's take this on a little bit further. Verse 28, a king glories in the number of his loyal followers. This is in the Passion Translation. But a dwindling population spells ruin for any leader. In the Mishlei, it gives a little bit different of a picture here. At least based on the, the ways that I would interpret these, just from the words themselves. Remember, God's calling us to this place. Father's calling us to this place of seeing beyond. So verse 28 says this in the Mishlei, in a multitude of people is a king's glory, but without a nation, rulership is broken. So let's look into this. Let's look at, now let's take the spirit of the fear of the Lord and let's look at it from the place of the expression of authority because we're keeping the same theme here. Every verse connects to the verse before. And so when we, when we begin to see this, the verse alludes to how a king would have prosperity in a multitude of people. And so the kingdom, the king and the kingdom would be able to do more because of the multiplicity of people, because of the amount of people that are there. And so when it comes to fighting a battle, there's a there's a, 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 a more of a confidence in the place of having many warriors and many people that are a part of that. So to protect that, that, uh, that you are trying to protect your, not only the kingdom, but also your, your people that are in the kingdom, at least from the king's perspective. The lack of a nation 
hints that the same king, instead of being a good king, so one who fears the Lord, let's let's go back to that place of of, of the the parent and child that I talked about in the beginning, right? How how our children learn from us when they see the way we respond to something. Don't think that that if your children are older, I want to add this to this. Got to hear Holy Spirit saying this. Don't think that your when because your children are now older that they still don't look at you. They do. So don't think because maybe you responded wrong, uh, differently when you were younger and when they were growing up that they don't see the way that you respond now because they do. They still see you. You can see you are still teaching your children. Remember, even just like I said, where how sometimes we walk through something and we didn't respond correctly, but then we come back around and we begin to realize what's going on. They saw that too. But then they see even us as parents who mature in the middle of the process and begin to respond differently. So don't think you know, you're just, you not teaching your kids anymore because you're even if they're out of the house, our daughter doesn't live with us anymore. But I know that she sees in that place of the way that we respond. So let's go back to this leader here. If I have a leader who fears the Lord and, and who is walking through a place of difficulty, and I see his responses to that, do you not think that, that if I'm looking at this leader, that I'm going to have a greater trust in them? Because they're ruling from this place of, of recognizing that they are under the Lord themselves and that that they are kind. Their, their expression is one of, let me look at the whole. And, and yes, I may be the leader. I may be the king, but I'm not separated from you. I'm one with you. You see what I'm saying? How, how, how a king and a kingdom can be one together. Because when a king and a kingdom work and operate as one, you can't stop them. Period. You cannot stop them. Go back and look at some of the, the Israelites and some of the wars and the battles that the Israelites fought. Even today, the, the, the Jewish nation, the is Israel being as small as it is, and the and the worldwide the worldwide uh I don't even know what to say here. This worldwide torrent against Israel that we kind of see or, and, or, and that it's going on right now. And yet Israel remains in that place of knowing who their father is. I don't care whether you think that they're right or they're wrong in anything that they're doing. It doesn't matter. I think it does matter when it comes down to the I'm just saying this, look at Israel, look at what's going on. Now, we are spiritual Israel as well. So look at Israel. I really believe we're about to see one of the greatest miracles that we've ever seen in our, in our nation and in our world, based on some of the things that are going on right now. I really do, without a doubt. I don't want to say any more than, than that. For me, what I'm trying to say here is when I look at Israel, what I see, I'm talking about the nation now. I see this place of a people who has stood up and said, I know who my father is. I know who my God is. And in him will I trust. He is my place of refuge. He is that place that I go when even when I don't even I, when all this other stuff is going against me, and and it seems like it's nothing that I've done, but something that's that's come against me just because I am. I'm going to stand in that place of saying, "Lord, you are my refuge. You are my ever present help in time of trouble. You are my rock. You are my God. In you will I trust." I don't know why I brought that up, but I'm I, I I can just I know for me since October 7th, there has been this place of of from 
an American Western mindset, if you will, I'm like, man, we have never been through what the people of Israel go through and have been going through for thousands of years in this place where even their very life is at risk because of what they believe. I don't know about you, but that just, that, that hits me deep inside of my heart. And I'm like, Lord. So let me get back to where this is. I'm, where I'm talking about here. So this king is operating from the place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord and his people come behind him. The next part of this verse actually says, but a dwindling population spells ruin for any leader, which is what Dr. Simmons wrote. But in the Mishle, it says, but without a nation, rulership is broken. If that same king operates where he is causing fear in his people and rules by the perspective of fear, do you think the, the 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 his people will trust him? No, because they're afraid of everything that they do. They're afraid of what happens. And if and if a kingdom is coming against the king, what do you think that a people whose whose king is operating from this place of giving fear and ruling by fear will do? Bing! They're going to take off. Right? They're not going to stand there and protect the king in this because the king has ruled by fear. So what this verse does is take what we've been talking about in the first three verses or first two verses and begin to look at it from another perspective. So let's continue on with this. Verse 29. When your heart overflows with understanding, You'll be very slow to get angry. But if you have a quick temper, your impatience will be quickly seen by all. Now, let's go back to the previous verse and how those two connect to them. The first part of that verse in the Mishle, it says this, slowness to anger shows much understanding, but a quick-tempered person elevates foolishness. I like that term, elevates the foolishness. And I'll explain that here in just a, in just a minute. So let's go back to the, the ruler who stands in the place, who is, who's operating from this place of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. In the spirit of the fear of the Lord, I recognize that I myself am standing before a holy God. And as I look at myself and my flesh in respect to that perspective of a holy God, it makes me rattle because I realize my own shortcomings, at least in the shortcomings in my in my flesh. My spirit man is, is of the Father and it's strong. But this part of me, this, this, this housing that I live in, this flesh that I live in and I deal with every day begins to, to quake and shake in the place of recognizing how, how much I need His holiness. How much his glory changes me. And from that place, do you not think that when you see others who are going through difficult times, who are struggling with something, that now you have a different expression of what that's talking about? About how they may be feeling in the midst of that? Because you yourself have felt it as well. And so there's a, and even when they they retort, I, I'm I'm really thinking about a situation where sometimes you're talking to somebody and suddenly they they retort back to you or they 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 shout back at you because they're angry about something or they're bothered about something or maybe they're just fighting a battle on the inside of them. You came up and said something right in the middle of this battle and their response is one of of protection because they're fighting the battle on the inside of themselves. I have a choice then of the way that I respond to that person. Do I immediately retort? Well, if that's the case, then I'm I'm operating from that place of the second part of this verse. But a quick-tempered person elevates foolishness. In other words, I've I've taken what they said and and saw it as 
really come from a place of foolishness myself. And so from the very core of my flesh, the very bottom of my feet, and the foolishness of of every fiber of my being, I elevate it up to my thoughts and my speech. In other words, the very core of who I am has brought up foolishness and then expressed it because I've been quick at temper. I, I retorted quickly. I responded quickly or reacted quickly, if you will. But from that place of recognizing, wait a minute, I see that you may be going through the same things that I've gone through. Because you know what? I've done the same thing. Somebody's talked to me and I, I shouted back at him. Didn't really want to, but I was dealing with something on the inside of me that, that, that at that moment, it just triggered something. And I hate that word trigger. <laughs> I do. I hate that word trigger. <laughs> I trigger over the word trigger. So go figure. <laughs> I do. I because it's it's sometimes it's given as an excuse for something. And I just it there's something about it that 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 bothers me. And I think part of that has to do with this verse. In a trigger brings up that place, that place in the expression of foolishness. No, let me be slow to anger. What is that? Psalm 141. I hadn't planned on talking about this, but Psalm 141, I believe it is. Let me look it up real quick. It's 145, I think. Is it 145? Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Reb. Thank you. Psalm 145. Let me use a different version than this. Just to make it a little easier. I will extol you, O my God and King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. Those of you that have ever been around me, any, you usually hear me begin. And even when I, not not necessarily when I do the the, uh, uh, blessing at the end of the class, but if you hear me pray or anything that you always hear me say, Father, we bless you. And it comes from, from this verse. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Verse three, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his garments, excuse me, his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on your glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and and shall sing of your righteousness The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy, and the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. And I'll stop right there. The Lord is gracious and slow to anger. As I'm looking into his face and I'm becoming what I behold, that I'm becoming gracious And I'm becoming slow to anger. Why? Because again, the spirit of the fear of the Lord is there that helps me to realize I am one in many, but yet I am one in him. So I almost hate this because I've I've been been hearing this and it's it's, it's a lie that's being perpetuated through social media. And that's that's the place of, of... having us think that we are small and little amongst everything else in the cosmos itself. That's not true. I, I remember one time I got into an argument with a lady <laughs> and, and I did, I, this is where I responded in, inappropriately. Although there was a spirit of the fear of, of um, this is one, a place where I really believe I got angry and was sinning not, but anyway, it had a, an interesting, and we were talking, we were at a work and we were talking about aliens <laughs> And and I just some some people believe that there could be other worlds out there. I personally don't. And the reason why I don't is this, and this is what it takes me back to, and this is where the Lord led me to. And I thought, if God made the entire cosmos just for us, how important would that make us? That argument right there alone was enough for me, for me to say. I'm not even going to worry about whether they really exist or not. 
And uh, I said this to this 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 lady, and and she was trying to tell me I had to believe it. And I was like, no, I don't. And the argument ended, ended with this place of saying, you cannot tell me what I can or cannot do. I know what I feel. I know what I see. I honor your perspective, but I'm I'm not going to see that. So why did all this this come into this? Well, when I see this place of us being a facet of of one in the midst of a, a lot of other facets, when I look at the diamond of Yahweh, I see a multifaceted, beautiful diamond that expresses the fullness of the glory of God. Right, and I, I mentioned it earlier. If one facet is missing. Does it have its full glory? No, it's missing a facet. It's missing a part of the beauty of what it was intended to be. But yet at the same breath, I am one facet in the midst of all of these facets. But I have a part to play. You remember that statement I made a little earlier? The one that Jen had uh, had written? Or had not had written, but had, had, had pulled out from this uh, website? I come to the realization that if I don't add my two bits in, that the whole system would fail. That's how important you are. That's how important each and every one of us is. And from that place, if I respond to you and I cause you hurt, I cause you harm, I cause a place of where now you're you're withdrawn within yourself and you begin to veil yourself off. And the light of the glory of the Lord through you cannot be seen because now you're dealing with this place of, of feeling like you're wrong or messed up or whatever. And, and you've, you've, you've wrapped yourself up away from everything else. Does your, does your facet shine as brightly in that place? No, it doesn't. So my heart is then to say, no, let me respond in this place of graciousness. Let me be slow to anger. Let me, let me, in my own way, let me show you how Father has taken me through these same things, and 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 maybe it can help you a little bit. Holy Spirit's the great teacher. He's the one that will lead you and guide you, but how does he do it? Many times he does it through each and every one of us. So every joint does supply. Everyone, just like Paul talked about, every one of us supplies into the whole being. If one cell, let me just make it super simple. If one cell in the body decides to do what it was not intended to do and decides it wants to do something else and rebels, you know what that's called in modern terms, in medical modern terms? Cancer. If one cell chooses to be something other than what it was meant to be, very simple. How can there be in the place of the glory of God where there's any kind of cancer. It's, it's not. It's not possible. It's not possible. So how does then that make me all that much more when I recognize that I am fully dependent on you just as much as you are fully dependent on me, Father, that they may be one, just as you and I are one, and that we together are fully dependent upon him. And he is fully dependent on us. Just as you and I are one, us in them and them in us. Let's continue on. You see, the whole part of this is what I've been explaining already in verse 30. In the, in the Passion Translation, it says this, a tender, tranquil heart will make you healthy, but jealousy can make you sick. In the Michelet, it says, a tender heart is the life of the flesh, but envy brings rotting to the bones. Both of these bring up two different aspects of here, but what I'm hearing Holy Spirit say is just what I've already been talking about. A tender, tranquil heart will make you healthy, but jealousy or envy will make you sick. You know, it makes me wonder, and I and I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you, the Michelet references this, and uh, it really kind of struck me a little bit because I see a connection here 
with the story of, of Leah and Rachel. You know, Jacob, when he went to Laban, he worked seven years to get Rachel, the one, the woman that he loved. And Laban tricked him, and he ended up marrying um, Leah first. There's a beautiful story that goes on beyond that, that 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 actually speaks more, but I don't have time to get into that right now. Um, and then he worked another seven years for Rachel, and then he was able to marry her. But as Leah began to have more and more and more children, because the vast majority of the the twelve tribes were born out of Leah, were born with between Jacob and, and Leah. The other was only two that were born through Rachel, and those were Joseph and Benjamin. So there was a part in Scripture where it talks about how Rachel began to be jealous of the number of kids, the number of children, and the number of sons that she was bearing to um, Jacob. But as Jacob was called to go back into the place of the promised land, to the place of where they were at, and then, of course, on to uh, Egypt because of Joseph, that Rachel died along that path. And the scripture talks about her being jealous over that. The woman that he loved the most was the one who died the fir died first. And so this verse begins to, you know, I, I'm, I it was just something I'm, I'm just sharing with you guys. I, I've not, I've not had a chance to really meditate on that greatly, but it was something that struck me as I was reading this in the Michelet and how it looked in this place of of the jealousy aspect of this. And I want to wrap it up with this because I think many times we begin to compare ourselves with others. One of the facets, one of the expressions of the facet that Father has made me to be is a teacher. Now, I recognize that I am just an, a voice in the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm. It's he who teaches. You hear me say that a thousand times if I say it once. It's he who teaches. He's the one that, that that takes you on your personal private path, that as I'm speaking, he takes you on a place where he correlates what we're talking about. And sometimes on a whole nother level than, than what I'm talking about, but it's something that matters to you. And Holy Spirit's the one that does that, not me. But many times we get to a place where we begin to compare ourselves with one another. And they look and say, well, this, this facet sure does shine brightly, and I don't shine very bright. It's a place of envy. It's a place of, of jealousy. It's a place of looking at another. My good friend, and he's passed away now, I miss him greatly. My good friend, Christopher Carter, we were at a conference one time, and, and uh, him and I were teaching both at the same conference. We had a chance to sit down one-on-one -on -one to talk. We and at this particular conference, and he brought this up. He said, I don't see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the way that other people see it. And I was like, hmm, funny, I don't either. The Lord had been walking me through a, a different revelation about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I said, so tell me, what is it that, what is it that you're seeing? And he said, to me, the best way of being able to describe the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree of comparison. When I compare myself against someone else, each and every one of us are facets. And to think and to believe that I am anything less than what Father has made me, it's just like putting a veil over top of the light that Father has put on the inside of me. Do you realize how important you are to not only your relationship with Father, but your relationship to everyone else? Father, that they may be one. How each and every one of us are necessary. And it's the spirit of the fear of the Lord that begins to help me to recognize how important each and every one of us are. And from that place, I'm going to respond 
as a as in a very tender and tranquil heart. There was a rabbi that that I, I can't remember now where I read it, but it was a rebbe that said this in uh, I believe in maybe it was earlier in the Proverbs. I can't remember, but he made the statement that said, "If you cannot respond out of the place of peace." I'm going to use modern terms here. If you cannot respond to someone out of the place of peace, shut up. Don't say anything. It would be far better to respond in the place of a tender and tranquil heart, recognizing that other people are going through the same things that we've been through. Maybe it's a different situation. Maybe it's a different whatever the case may be, but each one of us have gone through things that has caused pain inside of us. And so we recognize that. You see, truthfully, that's another expression of the spirit of the fear of the Lord, because then I see each and every one of us as being absolutely necessary. Each and every one of us having, if you will, Amy said this the other day, in, and, um, and I really appreciate that. She brought about the place of the expression of the widow's might. Remember the widow who brought the one single might when Yeshua was standing there by the, the treasury as they were bringing the, 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 the monies into the temple? And he told the disciples when she dropped in her one little might, she said, she has given far more than any of the rest of them. And she connected that to that statement of what this is saying right here. Do you see the beautiful picture of this? A tender, tranquil heart will make you healthy. It will allow you to say that, hey, even in this one little place that I'm only giving just a little bit, oh, it doesn't matter because before Father, he sees it as great. And he recognizes the, the, oh, Rebekita. He recognizes his glory in you. He sees the place of his holiness in you. And so, Father, it is from this place that I declare to your people, Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you and to allow you to see the wealth and the greatness of who you are. May the Lord turn his face, his countenance, his presence towards you and give you peace and shalom. Blessings and shalom.